Lord, here's another session. We need your spirit now, even as much as we did, oh God, in the first session, even more so now. Because, Lord, what we are learning does not cause the powers of hell to be happy. But, Lord, we ask you to bind them, tell them to continue to keep their mouths shut while your word goes forth. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. That our hearts become circumcised. That our heart into a place of rest. Let us no longer walk as a condemned people, but as a liberated people. A people that have their faith in your word and not what they walk through, not what they see, and not what they feel. We ask you in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen, please. Amen. Well, we left off before the break, if you remember, in the book of Colossians. And this is cassette tape number nine and videotape number nine on the book of Romans. This is our first day of Bible school. This is the second session of the first day again. And we'll have another five weeks after this one. We're looking at why there's no condemnation of those of us that's in Christ Jesus. We had just entered the first verse of the eighth chapter of Romans where Paul writes, there is therefore now no condemnation of those that are in Christ Jesus. Now, I like the way the King James puts that because it will usually add to those who walk not after the flesh, but they walk after the Spirit. Does anybody have, have a King James Bible, right? Does that in your 8th chapter, first verse, in the King James? Just read that in the King James out loud, please, ma'am. Do you see that? You hear that? Now, the numerical standard will pick that up later on, that very same statement, which the King James will fail to mention. But that's exactly right, and that's what we're talking about, because we're not walking what our minds tell us or what our thoughts tell us. Is that right? We're listening only what the Word of God says to us, and the Spirit of God will always come while the Word of God is being proclaimed, not the doctors of man, not the opinions of man, not the theology of man, the Spirit of God works with the Word of God, and it produces fruit. Amen? The Word is the seed, the Spirit is the rain, and then comes the fruit. Is that clear? Now let's go back to what it says in Colossians. Colossians 2 is where we left off. I think. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Verse 13. Now folks, let me say something to you. When we were God's enemies, he did this for us. If you're in a place of compromise, God doesn't like it, but I'll say this to you, you have made a step toward it, and he knows that. And we'll see later on in Romans 8, he will freely give us all things. And these things are those things that pertain to life and godliness, as Brother Peter writes to us. But this is what Brother Paul says to us. Verse 13, Colossians 3. This is why there's no condemnation of those who think Christ Jesus. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, it's like the way he writes that. It's actually a wonder why he was saved when I had no knowledge of walking by faith. I would say, Paul, you don't understand. I'm still uncircumcised in my flesh. You see, I was listening to my own thoughts. I was listening to the demon powers. What does the word say? Verse 11 is what the word says. Would you please, class, read verse 11 out loud to me so I can hear you? Stop. Stop. You know, I couldn't even hear what y'all said. I'm so deaf, you know. Read that first part again, just one more time. Does this say we were all so circumcised? We were also circumcised. Why is there condemnation? Because we didn't really believe we were also circumcised. When the power was coming around you, leave me alone, flesh. You've already been cut away from me. Just die and leave me. It had happened. That's what salvation is about. That's what the cross is about. Seven, the cross is my liberation. The cross is my liberation. Then how can there be condemnation? Say this with me. My old self was nailed to the cross. My old self was nailed to the cross. How in the world can you put up with guilt and condemnation? So Paul says to us in verse 13, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him. He said he did that while you were still a sinner. having forgiven us all our transgressions. 
That's why you can tell any sinner you meet, I say to you that your sins have been forgiven you. That's the ministry of reconciliation. And they'll say they have. Yeah. But you understand, man, I'm hooked on crack. Your sins have been forgiven you. That's the ministry of reconciliation. Are you listening to me? We speak by faith. We walk by faith. Paul said it this way. He said, according to that which is written, I believe, therefore I speak it. Can you imagine the maturity of God's body when his body begins to speak even by faith of what's been written and not by what they feel, what they're going through, what they see? Can you imagine that? That's how Paul wrote and spoke. But Lord, how did you do this? Verse 14, having canceled out the certificate of debt, that means every curse was broken. Then why are you put up with curses now? Because you didn't believe this. You're going to learn about what it means as a man think it, so is he. You'll learn why they caused five million people to be destroyed in the wilderness because they said, we became like grasshoppers in their sight, in our sight, and then in theirs. The demon powers cannot eat you until you tell them, yes, you can eat me, I'm eatable. In Christ, we cannot be eaten by demons, amen? But if you're in Christ and walking in unbelief, you will be eaten by demons. I can take from experience. That's what it says. He's canceled the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees, which was hostile against us. He has taken it out of the way. What did he do with it? He nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authority, he made a public display of them. How did he make a public display of them? When he was seen alive from the dead folks, their goose were cooked. Having triumphed over them through him. Are those words also in your Bible? Yeah. Are you still walking in guilt and condemnation? Go to Ephesians 2. Again, notice this is still Paul's revelation, isn't it? His revelation is always the same no matter what you're reading. Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. He just explained to you what it means to walk in the course of this world. You go by that spirit of evil. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. He just told you about your flesh. Your flesh is of the world. Everything in this world is lust. Your flesh loves the world. That's why the prosperity message is so popular. That's why I bite my tongue. And I'm not trying to condemn them. I'm trying to say it in a way to shake them up. Are you listening to me? Jesus said, love not the world or things in the world. For all in the world is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, the most of pride of life. And the world is lust is passing away. Jesus spoke those words to us through Brother John in 1 John. Is that right? When Jesus himself walked this earth, he said it this way. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things be added. What is the profit of man if he gained this whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Man will give in exchange for his soul to have his lust fulfilled. Ask Esau. He said, we formerly lived there. But let me ask you a question. Suppose you're saved, born again, and you find yourself bound again by lust. What happened? What's well, to that person? Wallowing in the mire. Wallowing in the mire. Backsliding. The backsliding. They're like pigs in the vomit. Unbelief. Unbelief. Doubt. Thoughts condemning them. Walking in good and condemnation. Saying, I believe what I feel more than what the word of God says. That's what he meant. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. And therefore, if they don't ever wake up, guess what? Isaiah 5 says they go straight to hell. It's in your Bible, Old Testament, Isaiah 5. Okay? And now we begin to see this about the carnal mind that is death, the carnal mind that is hostile to God, the carnal mind that is enmity with God. That's what this verse 3 is about in Ephesians 2. 
Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Every human being that's born on this earth naturally is a child of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus? Amen. You're either in Christ Jesus or condemnation one. Make up your mind. You make up your mind not about what you feel, folks. You make up your mind not about what you have failed in, folks. You don't make your mind about what has happened in the past, folks. You don't make your mind about what you're going through right now, folks. You make your mind about what the Word of God has declared. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the Word of our testimony. The Word of our testimony is the testimony that God gives in the Word of God. This Word is our testimony. Amen? Your testimony is only what God has done. Period. Say with me. God has set me free. God has liberated me. God has broken the powers of hell over my life. I don't care what you're going through. This lady in the front row is going to be praying for her husband beat her so bad she can come to church. She told me yes, says, she says, everything's fine, I'm still going through. I told her, don't go about what you're going through, honey, you keep standing on the word of God. Are oh, you listening to me? Well, Let's go one more place. Let's go to Titus 3. I'm going to tell you something right now, folks. You better get it straight in your head. God is not impressed by anything we do. He's impressed by what his son has done. Amen. And we're like little birds saying, Father, you've already, you have it. You've done it. Give it to me. Let it be manifest in me. I groan to be transformed. Titus 3, verse 5. Please don't forget this one. Because we got demon powers always, religious spirits always trying to get us snared in religious works. Religion is a demonic stronghold that's stronger than the spirit of lust. That's why I want to give you Titus 3 5. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. But according to his mercy, if you think you can be saved by what you're doing, folks, you're saying to God, I don't need your mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, what do you think has happened to your minds today? Paul said, for me to write these things to you again is no trouble for me. Peter said, I'm going to stir up your sincere mind by way of remembrance. When you begin to remember these things and say, yeah, that's true, the Holy Spirit with the word of God is washing, that's the water, and renewing, that's the word of God, by the Holy Spirit. It's based on what God has done. Amen? Not what we can do or what we've done. All we can do is use the fail in our own selves. Let's go back to Romans 3. Everything I'm showing you is Romans 8 1. I'm trying to give you what's called overkill. Overkill means when you're given too many scriptures to prove a point. And one or two would have done the very same thing. Whenever I come against religious demon spirits, and that's what getting condemnation usually is, I try to give you so many scriptures that when the demon spirits come back to you next time, and they will come back, they like beating up uh, people that are cowards. But the Bible says the cowardly will end up in hell. That's in your Bible, Revelation 21. The fifth will be in hell. That's in your Bible, Revelation 21. And God didn't call us to be cowards. He said, how did I command you to be strong? Is that what he told us? So you begin to beat these demon spirits with the word of God I'm giving you today. In Romans, the third chapter, the 26th verse, for this demonstration I say of his, of his right at the present time, that he might be the just and the justifier of who? Of the one who has faith in Jesus. 
worth in his boasting. It's excluded. There's nothing I can boast about. There's nothing you can boast about. I can't boast even about being able to understand the scriptures. Neither can you. It's what he's done. Was it by some kind of law? Sarcastic. Now I just throw this in. You're going to put there with a question mark by man's so-called steps and formulas? What do you think steps and formulas preaching is? It's law. If you do this law, then God's got to do this. You can't bribe God. You can't tell God what to do. Job told it to his best. God answers a new man. God does what he wills to do. You think he got God in a box, he'll break out somewhere else. I always tell God every day, it's a new day, Lord. I don't know what you're going to do, but just, just you one thing. Direct my steps, turn my eyes from vanity, turn my heart from all lust, and cause my feet and my heart to be bent to your commandments. Do you still pray those prayers, the 86 prayers in Psalms 119? How many, Bonnie? 86 prayers in Psalms 119? Was it 90? No, Psalms 119. Oh. <laughs> this is what he says. Well, is it by some works? Oh, I know, Lord. It's got to be by some works that I'm doing. No, not by de our deeds. There is nothing we can do. We're helpless. Lord, I'm your workmanship. I'm a candle. Light my fire. Form me, shape me, mold me into what gives you glory. Have you, have, you, have you called on that point yet? Then how could that be the condemnation? When you fail, say, see God, see how helpless I am? Oh Lord, complete your work in me. Lord, help and get this out of me so I won't ever fall and, and fail this way again. Because see, Lord, I see right here, it's not by some kind of law, it's not by any works, but it is by law of faith, it's having faith in you doing it. I'm your workmanship, Lord. Verse 28, for we maintain that a man is justified, that means acquitted, vindicated from all evil, by faith, apart from the works of the law. Now for all those once saved, always saved, and Calvinists that always tell me things like, it's not, uh, it's by works. Well, they say to me, excuse me, I got it backwards. They say, well, it's just by faith, it's not by any works. I've said to you many times before, don't just take part of the scriptures. The Bible tells very clearly in the book of James that our part are always works of obedience. There's always works of obedience. Always remember that. We ought to obey him. Amen? And if you don't obey him, folks, I can tell you right now, your faith is nullified and made void. Well, is God the God of Jews only? That's what we act like. Is that the God of Gentiles also? And sometimes we're getting prized to see we're better than they. No, we're not. We all have learned that all are under sin, whether Jew or Greek. Is that right? Yes, of Gentiles also, verse 30. Since indeed God, who will justify, that means vindicate and acquit, the uncircumcised, how will he, how will he justify and acquit the uncircumcised? By faith. It's right there. Just look at the next two words. Circle them. By faith. How about the uncircumcised? Faith. Through faith. What is faith in what God has done and is doing? Total trust in him. Total reliance upon him. Amen? Well, let's go back quickly to Romans 5. Because I want to remind you of this first verse in Romans 5. And I'm trying to go a little bit faster so I can get to the mind today. Because I hate to go through another six-week period in the book of Romans. But if we have to, we will. Therefore, he says, what does therefore mean, please? Some to everything said above, therefore. Now this is right after us by hard work. You don't walk by what you see. You don't consider your own body now dead. God will justify us too. He will reckon it to us also, just like he reckoned it to him. He's a respectable person. Therefore, having been justified, that means vindicated and acquitted, by faith, we've got peace with God. Let me ask you a question. Listen to me. Very simple question. When you really grasp what we just looked at this morning, 
How in the world can you be under such getting condemnation that you walk in fear to approach God? You got peace with approaching God, don't you? You look forward to going before him, don't you? Is that the truth? That's what he said to us right here. Therefore, having justified by faith of what God has done and is doing, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. We exalt in hope of the glory of God. Do you know what we're saying? I'm going to say something right now. If you walk around getting condemnation, you'll never stand and you don't ever look forward to being made perfect and completed. But when you get this in your heart, in your crawl, listen to me, you'll say, Lord, yes, I fell today, but oh God, I'm so sorry. I've grown over it. I'm a wretched man. Lord, I'm standing what you've already done. You said I'm complete in you. Lord, I look forward. I can see myself, oh God, justified, beautiful with the jewels of your loveliness, of your character, of your nature, of your likeness. I can see myself, Lord, not having the strain to obey you. I see myself, Lord, where you have cut out of me all these roots of evil and oppression and bondage and, and, oh God, and all the works of my flesh. Exalting in hope of the glory of God. I see your glory manifested in me, flowing through me. Are you catching on anything? Now we go back to the eighth chapter and we come to the second, first verse. There, there is, therefore now, no condemnation for those who are in, the, in Christ Jesus. King James translation. To those who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, which means you don't think of the natural mind. Folks, all this stuff about logic and, and, and reasoning is for the birds. The birds mean the birds of the sky for the demon spirits. Okay? We walk by what the word of God says. According to what is written, we believe it, therefore we speak. Can you say amen? amen. Then we come to verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life, where is it located? In Christ Jesus has set us free, are going to set you free. What does it say? Has, has set. Does that mean it has already happened? Yes. Has set you free from the law of sin and death. You can, therefore, you can boldly say by the word of God, Romans 6, I don't have to walk in sin anymore. By the word of God, I have been set free. This stronghold that has been gripped, you are an absolute lie. Depart from me. The word of God has declared, I have been set free. And I stand against you in Jesus' name until you leave me. For what the law could not do, weak as it was to the flesh. I'm going to pause. Somebody help me. I'm having trouble with my eyesight. What do the next two words say? God did it. God did it. You ought to circle those words. God has done it. God did. God did. The law couldn't do it, but God did. Man couldn't keep the law, but God did. Now, the rest of this verse tells us how he did it. How did he do it? Sending his own son not in sinful flesh, in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Did y'all know that when Jesus walked on this earth in the flesh, the Bible says very clearly in him the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in bodily form? The fullness. The fullness. <laughs> Glory. <laughs> Did he make a mockery of the powers of hell when Jesus walked in the earth? Amen? Amen? Well, Lord, how did he do it? Let me uh, show you some scriptures that's been twisted and perverted. Let's look at, first of all, in Philippians 2, 7. Here we read, but he emptied himself. That means he came here with no reputation. He didn't come with an angelic choirs preceding him. While he was coming down to the earth, they were throwing little, you know, heavenly roses across his path and said, here he is, the great one, here's the Jesus. Didn't do it that way. There was no fanfare. Didn't come in any pride. He didn't come showing off his majesty. He emptied himself. Taking the form of a bond servant, a slave. May I show you again? How many rights do a slave have? None. None. 
You ought to get your good book and study the history of slavery. It'll help you understand what it means to be a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Very good reading. And being made in the likeness of man. Folks, he was God. He just looked like man. Huh, ah, glory. That's how he did it. Now this one is one of the most perverted scriptures I've ever heard in charismatic circles, prosperity circles, kingdom, dominion, theology circles that say that we're going to possess this earth and Another bag of worms. We're going to possess all the finances. And God's going to make us so filthy rich that the sinners are going to be so jealous. They're going to just start coming to the kingdom. God ain't bribing nobody coming to the kingdom. It's in 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter. And all it means is what God did. How did God do it? He sent Jesus. And here's what Jesus did. Now, folks, let me ask you a question. Are you looking forward to going to heaven? Say amen. Amen. Do you see yourself being beautified when you're in heaven? Is that right? With the jewels of holiness? Is that right? You know what's amazing about this? That's what this means. You know what we did with it? We took it and used it like Peter said we would in the last days, according to 2 Peter 2. He talked about that they will come in secretly among us and introduce destructive heresies. As far as I'm concerned, and forgive me, but the sheep of God to be told plain in these last days, the prosperity message and once they've always saved our heresies. Enticing men, he said, by the desires of the flesh. He said what happened in the last days. And they use this scripture to prove that God wants, wants us filthy rich. Let me just say this to you. You hear the broadcast, you notice something. We don't ever ask for money. We don't ever beg for money. You still take out a separate offering. We don't beg for money here. You know, the Lord told the truth when he said, if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things that you're having to be added to you, he has never failed us and he never will. Never will. I watch God move on people to give money. And I watched it once when he moved on to give some time big sums. And they'll always give to make up for the lack of those who didn't give. It, it's incredible to me. And I let men walk with me and watch it happen to prove it to them. I'll take Mark with me. Have me help me count the money. I'll say, look at this check, Mark. Look at these that didn't give this week. We have a little chart. Notice the, notice the bottom amount. And I'll say to them, when we add this up, it will be almost to the penny what we have to live and have every week to exist. It has never failed. When the time comes up for us to have, uh, I never forget one month, I said, oh, Lord, God gave us a surplus. We got $1,800 extra. Unbeknownst to me, Teresa just wrote a check that day for $1,800 to pay for two babies to be born. Wasn't no surplus at all, was it? He just met me, didn't he? <laughs> Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things being given to you, he's saying. I hear these guys on the radio say, this is a ministry of faith. I pray that you ask God to move on your heart to give what you give to me this week. The purpose of writing letters today is to get money. That's why I don't write letters. Are you hearing me? Seek first my kingdom and his righteous folks and whatever things you have need will be given to you, he said. He told the truth. God is not a liar. You don't have to have any cake sales. Or church bazaars, they are bazaar. You just keep seeking his kingdom. He told you in Romans what his kingdom was. His kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's not meat or drink. It's not an abundance of things. Amen? Amen. And I can say it because I'm a man that has had things, still have things. I'm not saying what are things. Amen? That's what he says to us very clearly here. Second Corinthians 8. Verse 9. For you know the grace. Oh, glory. Grace. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of y'all remember what the word Lord stands for? Oh, hallelujah. We know the power of God, don't we? We know the authority of God, don't we? Look what it says. You tell me how God did it. That though he was rich, 
does not talk, it's not talking about financial riches, folks. Yet for your sake, that means for you to be saved, sanctified, and perfected. He became poor, that means he took on the form of man. That's how he became poor. That's why Job says, in God's eyes, man, man is a what? A maggot. See, we see, with all the doctors of self-esteem today, we hate hearing what the Word of God says about man. He says, man is a maggot. All through the Old Testament, we read, you were Jacob. Have you ever considered what maggots do? Maggots feed on filth. Have you noticed how much man loves evil? And the more man goes into evil, the more depraved he becomes? He's a maggot. Go to joke for a moment. Why are y'all looking at me like this today? Will somebody please go to Job 25? Verse 4. How then can a man be just with God? How, how can he be clean who is born of woman? Don't take the attitude of some of these people that hate women and say women don't have no place in the church. Women got as much place in the church as any man's got. That's what he says. If even the moon has no brightness, that means to God, or the stars not pure in his sight, the stars not pure in God's sight, how much less man, what does God call him? That maggot. And the son of man, what does God call him? That worm. Go to the 15th chapter of Job, somebody. Look at the 14th verse. What is man? That he should be pure, or he was born of a woman, that he should be righteous. He talks about what God, how God sees man. Behold, he puts no trust in his holy ones. That's why I've said to you before, please don't put your trust in me. Please don't put your trust in anybody's rotten stake in the can flesh. My flesh stinks as much as your flesh stinks, and I'm fighting my flesh as much as you fight your flesh. He puts no trust. It's talking about God and his holy ones. And they say, oh, brother so-and-so fails. So we'll pray for brother so-and-so and keep walking with God. The heavens not pure, pure, pure in his sight. How much less one who is detestable and corrupt, that's man. Man who drinks iniquity, maggots eating filth like water. Is that in your Bible? That's what it means. He became poor, then he become rich. That you through his poverty might become rich. And when God talks about us being rich, he tells you how he wants us rich in the book of James. Go to James, please. I think it's 5-2. It's 2-5. I always get those numbers transposed in my mind. It's 2-5. Listen, my beloved brethren. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich to be rich in what? Dollar bills? Faith. Faith. In what? In, faith. in what? Faith. The just walk by what? Faith. We are cleansed by what? Faith. Their hearts were clear, purified by what? Faith. faith. He said, be rich in faith, not bucks. And heirs of the kingdom which he promised of those who love him. Are those words in your Bible? Quick, go back to Romans 8. I'm going to try to fulfill my words and get at least to the false, touch a little bit of something. <laughs> Romans, the 8th chapter. We looked at Romans 1, Romans 2, Romans 3. Let's look at Romans 4. Because Romans 4 talks about a righteous requirement of the law. The general of the law demands righteousness. Say with me, the law is still in effect. The law is still in effect. It's not made for a righteous man because God's wrath is not made for a righteous man. You know, everything that God has given has life in it. The law is still alive over this atmosphere. Oh, I wish I could talk to you about spiritual things. I'm trying to, well, help me to teach what I'm, I'm saying, what you showed me. The law is still alive. And this whole atmosphere of the earth is bound by the law. We walk with Christ, in Christ. We are free from the law. Amen? 
what happens when we sin? We go back under the law, and the law demands justice without mercy. It demands harshness from God. Demands it. Is that right? The law demands requirements for me and from you. That's what Romans 8, 4 is about. Am I giving you too much? Are you still with me? Yes. Romans 8, 4. Let's go back to Romans 3 so we can tie this in together. For what the law could not do, weak as it was to the flesh, God did. How did he do it? Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirement of the law, you might want to underline that, the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And here's where the New American Standard added what wasn't added in the King James. Who do not walk according to the flesh, that means the mind of the flesh, that means the lust of the flesh, that means the will of the flesh, that means the thoughts and the imaginations of the flesh, but according to the what? Spirit. What does it mean when it says walk? Lifestyle, also known as fruit and deeds. Is that right? A lifestyle you habitually live when no one sees you. See, today we're all together as the body of Christ. So we're all wearing our Jesus mask. What happens when you leave here and go inside your house and nobody sees you? That's what God's talking about. Christianity is not for the church. Christianity is for the world. Now, what is that righteous requirement of the law? Now, let me say something to you. This is one of the benefits of what God did when he sent Jesus. That the righteous requirement of the law be fulfilled in us. Let me just show you some of these R.R.'s, righteous requirements. Galatians, Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6, 5. It's one of the righteous requirements of the law. Did Jesus say, He it is that love me that keep my commandments? Talk to me. The law says, destroy everything in the earth that does not love God. Let me say it again. The law requires that everything in the earth be destroyed that does not love God. The law requires everything in the earth to be destroyed that loves its flesh. Did Jesus say the ones that hate him was anybody that commits sin? Yes. John 3, 20. Everyone, 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 everyone who does evil hates the law or hates the light or hates the sun or hates God. Everyone, 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 everyone. And that's some kind of secretary coming in my Bible class. You guys in late. Everyone, 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 everyone who does evil hates the light. Hates the light. Hates the light. Hates the light. The law requires everything in the earth that hates God to be destroyed. Is that right? Now you'll understand. In other words, the rights of the of the law is very simple. You better love God. Not with lip service, but with lifestyle, with deeds. Everything that does not love God, the law requires it to be utterly obliterated from the face of the earth. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. This is the heart of the law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your what? Heart, with all your soul, and with what? All your mind. And these words which I command today shall be on your heart. God, let me say something folks, when you say I love God and do evil, God says you hate me. John 3, 20. Everyone who does evil hates the law. That's what I said to you before. And one time I was teaching a session on the divine love of God, and I said, same with me, church. So church setting. I said, Lord, we hate you. We don't want to hate you. And I want you to get horrified. I hate you. And so I talked to some lady, and I said, let me ask you a question. Tell me about the things you spend your spare time with. What do you do? She you heard the testimonies. So why do you do that? I don't know. It fulfills me. It satisfies me. Why does it fulfill you? 
Why does it satisfy you? Mm-hmm. Why is not spending time with God in prayer satisfy you? Why is not just spending time just praising him and worshiping him not satisfy you? Why does this satisfy you more? There's a hatred there for him. There's an abhorrence for him in your flesh. You know how God set me free from watching television? I didn't check the TV out. You know why? It's just still there. Because, folks, I could check it out unless God hadn't cut it out. It's still there. Are you listening to me? And God didn't call me to be slaves to anybody's television set. Did you just see me? Here I am, self-righteous. Well, I got rid of my TV. And I go to this saint's house to witness to them, and they got their television on and the sports on, and I'm trying to tell them about Jesus, and my flesh is saying, well, who's winning over there? <laughs> but if I say, God, there's a lust in my heart for television. It loves you. It loves television, Lord, more than you. And God, only you can change my heart, Lord. I'm your workmanship, Lord. It's by your deeds done, Lord, not by mine. Well, take the love of television out of me. Well, God did that. I never had an object so boring in my house in all my life. You know when God did that, when he did to me? He imprisoned me. He imprisoned me with boredom. I'm just being honest. I've seen times when the, the Spirit of God would say, won't you pray? I don't feel like praying, Lord. And, I, and a thought comes, turn on the TV, something might be good on. So I'll turn it on, you know, and I'll click, and I'll press and I'll press. Is there any more stations on this thing? It's got to be one more somewhere. Nothing's on. I turn to the Christian channel. It bores me. I turn to the next Christian channel. It bores me. Finally, I say, turn it off. Okay, Lord, I'll try to pray. Ain't it crazy what we do? Then you start praying, and then the water comes. You say, oh, this is wonderful. Oh, I'm so glad I did this. Oh, Lord, I'm going to always do this, Lord. Oh, I just love this feeling, Lord. And then tomorrow comes, and then, won't you pray? I don't feel like it. What are you fighting against? That stupid, rotten, stinking, decaying flesh that hates everything there is about God. He told you the flesh lusts after the spirit and the spirit of the flesh. These are contrary one to the other. We don't call it that. We call it slowfulness. Laziness. We call it carnality. Whenever it's carnal, it's an enemy of God and it's hostile to God. And there never was and never will be a monster called a carnal Christian. That's modern American theology. Go back and read 1 Corinthians 3. It is a rebuke, not a tolerance and not an acceptance. And the whole doctrine of carnal Christianity comes from 1 Corinthians 3. You little carnal. Because I couldn't even speak to you as men of the spirit, but men of flesh. I talk to guys on the street like men of flesh. Is this making sense to you? More righteous requirements of the law. Look what it says in Micah 6 and verse 8. Oh, God. Thank God you're here, Steve. Micah 6, verse 8. I can turn this thing off my mind. He has told you, old man, what is good. You might want to circle old man and put maggot. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, that means obedience and righteousness. To love kindness. And to walk how? Humbly with your God. That's why... I'm abhorred by these people saying, I'm a king's king. Or the ones that shake their fists in God's face and say, I did make my hundredfold. I'm going to say, oh my God, how do you let them talk to you like that? We're living in the day of the false prophet. The shepherds of Assyria. How do you walk humbly with God? You walk as a little child. Jesus said, disciples, grown men, except you become converted as this little child, you won't even see the kingdom of God. He said, for well, the kingdom of heaven is made up of such as this. How many of y'all in here are parents? Would you wave at me? Good. How many kids do you have, Sister Kelly? Five. How about you, Brother Amos? Three. Who else got children? How many do you have, sister? One. 
One. How much you have, Betty? How about you, Brother Charles? Two. Any other parents? How many do you have? Two. How about you? Two. Two. How about you? One. How about you? Three. Got a question for all you mothers and professional baby raisers. When little Johnny was five, did you kick him out of the house? Did you tell him to get a job and go to work? No. You tell him to take care of himself? Why? He was a little child. How much of his needs did you supply as his parents? Aww. How many? Aww. Ain't it funny? Different nationalities, different races, different backgrounds. And I got the same answer. All their needs. That's what he meant. To walk humbly with your God. You better look for him for all your needs to be met. Amen. You as a man are incapable of doing anything for yourself. Are you listening to me? Folks, I think I'm going to teach on when God makes a man next. Because I've been bounding in my mind about what to teach in the next church session. I'm telling you, there is not one, listen to me, Jesus put it this way. He said, you can't even make one hair on your head black or white. He wasn't talking about, you know, Lady Clarol or Revlon. If you can't even do that, what makes you think you can change your character and nature? Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verse 35 and 40 through 40. This religious expert like Nicodemus asked Jesus a question. It's amazing the dialogue that Jesus had with religious experts of his day. I keep meeting religious experts. I got one on the phone yesterday. Call me all kind of names. I wonder if I preached the apostolic creed. I said, sir, if you talk about Jesus oneness, I'm not into that. It's about time we, I, I finally had to hang up when I was very nice. I said, sir, I'm going to hang the phone up. Goodbye. I hung up. But see, I'm changing. I used to slam the phone down. You Notice. Know I'll tell them I'm going to slam it down. You know. Matthew 22. Well, I know it's Matthew 22, isn't it? Yeah. 34. When the Pharisees heard he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered themselves together, and one of them, a lawyer, that means, that does not mean, uh, what's that law, famous lawyer's name? Can you think of a famous lawyer? Percy Foreman. Foreman. Don't talk about a Percy Foreman type. This is an expert in the Bible, a commentary writer. He understands all. The Bible expert. He asked him a question saying, Teacher, what's the great commandment of the law? Don't miss it. Because here's the right to come to the law again. He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with how much of your heart? Can I help you? That is impossible. You're not going to throw rocks at me yet, or are you going to stone me? <laughs> if the law requires that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, let me ask you one testimony. How many men did we read about that was able to fulfill the requirements of the law? Mm-hmm. What did Paul tell us? That no flesh is justified by the works of the law in the sight of God. And how can we be brought to the place? We can love the Lord our God with all our hearts. By the circumcision, that's right, sister, by the keep coming to Jesus, to be continuously circumcised. He must shed abroad his love in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that he's given to us. Oh, we try. Oh, Lord, I love you. I love you so much, Lord. Oh, really? Tomorrow comes and you fall flat on your face. That's not love, that's hatred. Tell them the truth. Become honest with them. Lord, there is still this hatred in me for you. There's still no hearts in me for you in these areas. But God, I want to love you. I'm coming to you. Lord, only you can put your love in my heart. Give him Hosea 14. Lord, from you comes my fruit. I have my own self can do nothing, Father. I'm a maggot. I'm a man. I told God this many times. I wanted to, as his ear sometimes ring me telling him so much. I said, Father, do you realize how horrible it is to be a human being?
That's what to be a human being is to be the worst of your creation. I think God likes that. You see, I've come to a place, folks, where I know there's nothing good in my flesh. You see, I don't have to guess about it. My flesh stinks. <coughs> Jesus told me the answer. Don't miss this. And you tell me when I read this if this sounds like the testimony of your life. If this is not the testimony of your life, your heart is not totally circumcised yet. You ready? Let's see what it says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Did I talk about some things giving me pleasure other than God? That's your soul. When I used to play basketball, that was my soul. I was satisfying something in my soul. I mean, we got then play basketball, didn't we, Byron, until we almost collapsed. And we're holding one another and goes, go, you want another game, brother? And then when I said, why are we doing this? I have been on crutches. And I put on two knee braces just to go back out in the basketball court. What was wrong with me? I was satisfying something in my soul. God is telling us he's going to bring us to a place where only he can satisfy our souls. And with all your mind, how many times do you find yourself fighting all kind of unholy thoughts? Let's get honest. I know one of the most famous preachers I've ever been with said to me one day, he says, do you ever, when you get ready to preach, find yourself fighting all kind of filthy sexual thoughts that's bombard your mind? I said, it used to happen to me a long time ago. Let me say it again. I said, I don't know how to say it proper. By God's grace, I'm free from lust. <laughs> See, I've been in God's woodshed enough. It's by his grace I am what I am in Christ Jesus, not by my own doing. Amen? How many times do you find yourself, you start thinking about things of God, all of a sudden, bam, something wild hits you, like, and you find yourself recalling and saying, oh God, please, I don't want that, Lord. No. You said, there's no kindness of those in Christ Jesus. I've been circumcised. Get away from me. You've been cut away from me. I'm complete in him. Is that how you react? Are you learning what the book of Romans is about? Amen. Jesus says this, man, this is the great and foremost commandment, and the second is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All right? Wonderful holy, filled people. How many of y'all can really look God in his eyeballs and say to him that you love all of humanity equally as you love your little selves? Don't speak up too fast at once. I mean, let me tell you, when we come to a place to see what we really like, then God will do the work in us. I am incapable of loving you, any of you, as I love myself, lest God, by the Holy Ghost, sheds abroad the love of God in my heart. And guess what? So are you. How do I know? You look like human beings to me. What I'm reading to you, folks, is what the law is continually crying out to God about me and you in the earth. This is the righteous requirement of the law. But in Christ Jesus, I'm covered. As long as I don't walk according to flesh, and I'm still walking toward him. Mark 12, same thing, but I just had to bring it in because Mark adds something. Mark 12. 33 and 34 is the same account. This religious leader knew this. Can I help you again? Listen to me, folks. You know how I know we're living on a day of God's judgment? 
You know how they were living in the fulfillment of Ezekiel's writings? Because today, the gospel is being opened to all of us. There's not one script in this Bible that God is not revealing in the earth. And before you can walk with God, you must first know what he requires. You see, here's where part of us will be separated. Some people just go for more knowledge. I go for the knowledge for one reason, one reason only. So I know how to pray to God and say, Lord, I see it right here. I cannot fulfill your word in myself. Lord, do this work in me. Here's what you require. So I know how to pray to him. Here's where half of those who think that the remnant will be cut away, separated. Because they're on a treadmill. It's getting more knowledge. You must first know what God requires so that when you go before him, you can ask him to do in you what he requires. That's what he talks about in 1 John. you mind if I get my old reliable Bible and read you something? I'm still not used to this new Bible, I guess you can tell. I do all my research in here still. The page can fall apart all they want to now. Go to 1 John with me for a moment. The uh, fifth chapter. Let's tell the Lord, thank you for the book of Romans. Thank you, Lord, for the book of Romans. Thank you, Lord, for the book of Romans. That's what this verse means. Romans, excuse me, 1 John 5, verse 14. This is a confidence which we have before him. But if we ask anything according to his will, what does it say? He hears, he hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. Let me ask you a question. You first have to know what God requires of us. Is that right? Yeah. Then you take that requirement and you go to him and you say, Lord, I can't do this. I'm a, I'm a maggot. I'm a man. I'm a worm. God put this in me. Then God will do it in you. Most will never come to that place. It's today the, the popular fad used to be, I'm an intercessor. Well, that still goes on somewhat, but today the popular fad is, I'm the remnant. Especially those of us that's been uh, exposed to the repentance message, we call it. And I'm watching the repentance message become another religion, just like all the rest of them. It too will fall by the wayside. Listen to what this man says to Jesus in Mark. 12, chapter 33, to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one neighbors as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, folks, has the kingdom of God come among us? That's right, isn't it? Can I show you something? Lord, help me to tell it to them in a way they can receive it. Remember the angel we're doing about in Genesis that keeps you outside the camp? You're not in the kingdom. Look what Jesus says to him. When Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, you are not far from the what? Kingdom of God. Are we in Christ? Yes. yes. <laughs> Luke twelve forty two. One more place. Oh, bless your holy name. said who then is the faithful full of faith and sensible mind of Christ servant whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time blessed is that slave I hope you're a slave of righteousness whom his master finds so doing 
when he comes, truly I say to you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. Romans 13, 8 verse. So that's what Paul mentally said. Not that I've obtained it, but I'm still doing it. I'm still pressing forward. Here's what the law requires. The righteous requirement of the law. Verse 8, Romans 13, 8. I can share the very same thing in the book of Galatians. Owe nothing to anyone. That's why you pay your bills. Are you hearing me? In fact, I know the radio station we own keeps saying to me, that's one thing I can say about you, Brother Boutte. You really believe in this scripture here, owe nothing to anyone. They always tell me when I go there, boy, you ought to see these preachers that just will not pay their radio bills. One of them said, what's your secret? He didn't like my answer, but I told him the truth. He first said to me, he said, Y'all must believe in prosperity over there. I said, no, we believe in seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. He said, oh, yeah. See, they think it's a cliche. They think it's just a cute saying. He thought he was being religious. I was being so honest. A Spanish brother called me and he said, brother, I've been on the radio. I had to go off two or three times. I've been on TV. I had to go off two or three times. How do you stay on? Because I know what it costs. I said, brother... I said, I cannot remember the last time I ever asked God for anything in the natural. I cannot remember. I don't ever pray to God about money. I said, I keep saying to him, Lord, do your work in me. Circumcise my heart. Cut out of me, Victor Boutte. Would you please slay this monster, Victor Boutte, Lord? I hate that monster, Victor Boutte. I said, and every time I do that, God just, you know, he circumcises my heart. And it just happens. Oh, and they get me a board. They say, oh, yeah, sure. I'm telling the truth. Are you hearing me? Mm-hmm. Owe nothing to anyone except to what? Love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. You might not believe it, but I'm telling you anyway. Love is not something that is natural with man. The love of God, this is agape here is supernatural. Only God has this kind of love. He can love us while we get sinners, love us while we still walk in transgressions. Only God can do that. Only, only the divine love of God can not take into account of wrong suffering. That's why people get their feelings hurt because they're not walking in the agape love of God. And none of us have it. That's why we all get our feelings hurt. That's why we just say, Lord, my feelings are hurt. Lord, cut this hurt feeling, baby goo-goo out of me and bring me to maturity, Lord. Don't ask God to do it. He won't do it. You have not because you ask not. That's the right requirement of the law. Are you catching on anything? For this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. That means a loss. If there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this one saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, everybody in here that's able to do that, please raise your hands. You can really say before God that you can love your neighbor as yourself. First, think about how much you love yourself, then look at someone else. If you're not in this place, folks, the law is just screaming against you. Verse 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, that word there is agape, is the fulfillment of the law, and only God can give it. How does he give it? When you ask him for it. Tell him the truth. Lord, I am mad at my neighbor. Lord, my neighbor makes me sick. Lord, give me the love of God. Let me see. Lord, let me love your, my neighbor as you love him. You have not because you ask not. When God does that, he's circumcising your heart. Let's go back to Romans, the 8th chapter. Hallelujah. God, watch over my words that not one falls to the ground. We just got to the part about the mind. Did I say that we'll get to the part about the mind today? Hallelujah, we made it. Romans 8. Which one says in the fifth verse? Let's take verses five through seven. You ready? But those 
who are according to the flesh. The most important word here is the word set. Set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, why do they set their minds? On the things of the Spirit. Let me help you. Ask God to give you the ability to keep your mind set on the things of the Spirit. The flesh will stop you. For the mind set on the flesh is what? Yeah. Death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, and your flesh hates the spirit. That's why you find yourself groping, tormented. A tormented person is one who has his mind set on the things of the flesh and the things of the flesh will never give him peace and satisfaction. He knows, why is he tormented? Because he knows, he knows by the word of God, he knows he's been exposed to the word of God, that peace comes only through Christ Jesus. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is set on thee, but his flesh hates to go to the war, to dig, to get to the water that's in heaven. For example, Holy Spirit says pray. Flesh says watch TV. Holy Spirit says pray. Flesh says go eat a lot. Go get, make yourself a milkshake. Be kind to yourself. You worked hard today. Holy Spirit says please pray. I need someone to pray in the earth now. Your flesh says tell him you'll pray later. He's tormented. That's what it says. Verse 7. Because... The mind set on the flesh is what toward God? Hostile toward God. There's your key of every backslider. That's the key of every quote carnal and then such monster Christian. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. It doesn't mean the Ten Commandments. It means the righteous requirements. To love the Lord our God with all our hearts, so mind, body, and strength. Love our neighbors ourself. For it is not even able to do so. Now folks, let me say something to you. Setting our minds. Controlling our thoughts. Is the only he, on our part, that brings about the circumcision and the changing of our hearts and establishing the character and the nature and the desires of God within our beings. That's our part. Setting the mind, controlling the thoughts, controlling the imaginations. You know where I learned that? God told me. Because I used to cry and go complain about these thoughts that keep coming to my mind. What was wrong? I didn't want to. Let me say this to you. If you don't take on the responsibility of controlling your thoughts, your thought life, you might as well stop playing like you're saved and just go out to the bars and just do all you know to do in the little time you got left before he comes because you want to pay for it. Let me say to you again, for those who are walking after the spirit and after the flesh, there's no condemnation. Proverbs, please. 22. 23, I think. Proverbs 23, 7. I think that's what it is. Let's go and check it out. 
If not, I'll just ask Bonnie. She seems to know where everything is. Yeah, still there. That's pretty good, folks. I, I use a new Bible to find it. For as he thinks within himself, so is he. Is that in your Bible? Yes. Let me ask you a question. Who told you to try to think about what's about yourself? The Lord said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. Did he say that? Did he tell us to think and to meditate on these things? Why don't you find a testimony of what God says about you and what it means to be in Christ Jesus and think only and imagine only on those things. Does that make sense to you? That's how you develop the mind of Christ. Let me say something to you. We are already complete in him. That means the mind of Christ has already been given to us but most of us don't exercise it. We keep playing around with the muck and the mire of the old mind. Why? Because the old way gave us some glory for our flesh and satisfaction. Have you ever met people, they first get saved, and only want to talk about what they used to be in life? I watched the church play this stupid carnal game with these ex-athletes and ex-movie stars. They get saved and all of a sudden it's like somebody special got saved. Let me tell you something. When these people are famous die, guess what? They are jumped and just dumped into hell like all the rest. Read what Solomon says. It's all vanity. I took a time when my friend came in his faithful Dice Cowboys, and this was about uh, this was a little part of last year, and he sat right behind you, Sister Kelly, and I looked at him and I saw him and I went, and the fuck came to me, tell the church that so-and-so is here. And the Spirit of God, he slapped me in my face. He said, why? So you can feel important? Make the church like it's something special here? He's, he's a sinner just like you were. Get him saved. I never with my mouth. We got millionaires come among here, and some of y'all know that. I treat them just like they're normal people. Because guess what? That's what they are. There's nothing wrong with being an athlete. There's nothing wrong with being a movie star. But you need Jesus too. Amen. It's a common salvation. God ain't got no superstars and celebrities in his kingdom. There's only one. His name is Jesus. In Genesis 6, I want to show you what's wrong with us. When we married Satan, and that's what man is. That's what flesh is. Flesh is the wedding garment of our bridal gowns when we married Satan. Let me show you what happened to us. When we married Satan by the fall in the garden, we married Satan with all our hearts and with everything in us. So much so, God made a statement about man and that's found in Genesis 6 and the 5th verse. This is a hostile mind that cannot do the will of God. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man on earth excuse me, that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent, please circle that, every intent of the thoughts of his heart, oh, now you know where the thoughts come from. They come from the heart. Was only evil continually. As long as you're thinking, what's in it for me? Evil continually. But how should we think? What's in it for God? A slave lives to do his master's will. A slave lives to satisfy every desire 
and longing for the master's heart. God blesses us in the ministry many times with those who we're married to. And in most people's eyes, they have the dirtiest part. I don't see it that way. I think they have the most glorious part. I see them with more compassion and more mercy than any minister, no matter how great his gifts are. And the ministry cannot do without them. It's called the ministry of helps. They can put up with things that drive us insane. And God has blessed us with two people like that in our ministry. I'm amazed by it. I look at our marvel. How can they do it? They're like slaves to the gifts and the callings of God. And they receive every reward that works in those, in those ministries. One more place is hostile mind. Look at Isaiah 55. I quoted it three times I know about this morning. I want to say it. Every thought. By the way, your Bible just said every thought and intent, didn't it? Yes. Okay. God says very clearly in Isaiah 55, verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way. Whenever you're doing anything in your way, it's wicked. And the unrighteous man, guess what? There's thoughts again. Why? Verse 8. But my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways. My ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Is it there? Isaiah 59. Look at verses 1 and 2, please. The Lord writes here. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save you. This is the ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Did we talk about last night that God will hear the prayers of habitual sinners? Only one he hears, Lord, forgive me and I'm forsaking my sins. I'm turning from them. Then God gives you mercy. Is that right? I want you to notice what it says about these people. Look, it says in verse 7 that they're doing. Who is God talking about? Now, I could have gone through this whole thing, but I want to zero in on verse 7 because we're talking about the hostile mind. Their feet run to evil. They hasten to shed innocent blood. That's what gossip and slander is all about. In fact, we talked before that gossip and slander means to speak witchcraft and to speak curses and spells. That's why every true minister must pray what it says to us very clearly. In Psalms 37, Lord, keep me from the strife of tongues. It keeps, in other words, keep the curses off of me. Look at their thoughts. Their thoughts are thoughts of what? Iniquity. So what's the end result of this way of thinking? Destruction and devastation are in their highways. They don't know the way of peace. The way of peace is the mind of Christ. Isaiah 65, verse 2 and 3. The hostile mind. Controlling the thoughts. Isaiah 65, verse 2. And three, the Lord writes by his Holy Spirit to us, to our brother Isaiah, the prophet. I have spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in the way which is not good. How are they doing it? Following their own what? Thoughts. Thoughts. And God says they are a people who continually provoke me to my face. This is not talking about any rotten, slimy center of the world or in the streets. This is talk about the people who claim they're in God. Jeremiah 4, verse 14. Jeremiah 4, verse 14. Just keep going toward the right. Hostile. Minds of the flesh is death. Enmity. Jeremiah 4, verse 14. Here God writes by his spirit, and he says to us, I get these new Bible pages unstuck. Wash your heart from evil, O Jerusalem. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Who did he address this to? Does it say rotten slime is of the world? No. Are we in the habits of Jerusalem? Yes. Yeah. That you may be saved. Oh, dear. 
How do you get your heart washed from evil? Amen. He talks about the thoughts. He says, how long will your wicked thoughts lodge stuck? Cement it. Weld it within you. In other words, controlling your thoughts, folks, is a way of salvation. And I'm going to tell you right now, what I just brought you into is the most difficult commandment and requirement from God. But a man that has no control over his thoughts is like a city without walls. The demon powers can just run in whenever they want to. Well, what did Jesus say about it? I know you know these, but let's look at it for the sake of this tape. They go different places. And I'm never bored with the word of God, are you? Matthew 15, 19, because I want to show it to you. Jesus speaks this. For out of the what? Heart comes what? Evil thoughts. Now let's go through this list of thoughts and see if you ever had any of these. Murders. Have you ever had a friend that swindle you and you had thoughts and imagination of taking machine guns and shooting them down or you could see yourself climbing his house with a gasoline can pouring gasoline on his chimney and lighting it or some kind of wild something like that or you was wishing somehow that when he goes skiing in Colorado he'd break his legs? Ever had those kind of thoughts? Those are called thoughts of murder from the heart. Adulteries. The Bible says if we look to lust, we've committed adultery. I've heard him say to me, what's wrong with just looking? Looking, <laughs> the eyes is the door to the soul. You can look if you want to. That's how the demons come in. If you know you have a weakness in your flesh in that area, don't look. You say, God help me. Don't look. And don't give that lie you just admire their beauty. Because God knows better. Fornications, these are thoughts. Thefts, false witness, slanders. Jesus said these are the things which defile the maggots, the man. <laughs> you know, I make people mad. I say things like maggots. One woman said to me, I tell you, I don't know what's wrong with that man. He is so full of bitterness and hatred and anger. The, the flesh is beautiful. God made it. And he calls it maggots. Romans 2 verse 15. Oh, this horrible, horrible mind of fallen man. God cut these horrible things out of our lives. Romans 2 verse 15. I talked about the thoughts condemning us, accusing us. Remember that? I'll tell you right now, folks, you can let your thoughts run berserk and accuse you if you want to. You can listen to that junk. I'm going to tell you right now, your thoughts will cause you to ignore and to blaspheme God's words. Your thoughts. Your thoughts hate you because your thoughts hate God. The Bible says here in Romans 2.15 in that they show the work of the Lord written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else doing what? Defending them. What does that mean? When you break God's law, your thoughts will rise to the rescue. Your thoughts fight for the flesh to live. Here's how it works. If your heart is near God, your thoughts will condemn you and accuse you. If you commit this sin more than once, more than once, more than once, then it'll defend you. It'll say, well, it's not really so bad. I mean, you know, Brother Amos, the sins are worse than yours. Look at Brother Charles. He's more horrible than you are. Defend you. And you and you you get you get life from it. You get peace from it, but I forgot to tell you. The source. 
Satan ministers life and peace to our flesh. That's what Jesus made a statement. He said, the peace I give you is not the peace that the world gives. I'm telling you right now. You know what happens to the person when they reach the place where their thoughts are always defending them? Hmm? Brother, you got it. The conscience has become seared or almost sealed. Let's all pray together. One minute. Well, let's just close in prayer. I have to stop there. I was having fun till you showed up. How much time I got left now? Less than a minute. I'm going to try. Quickly go to Psalms 1. Let's close on, on something to know what to do. Quickly, quickly. Thank God Steve's here. He knows how to shut this thing down. I'll turn there. Psalms 1. Folks, I love Bible school more than I do the church. Don't tell the church that. See, he want to take stop. We got it off because so they didn't hear it. I hate for this thing to end. I wish we could do this all day long, don't you? You think we're going to have the next session where we have just an eight-hour day with this? How many hours would show up? If we did this for eight hours, now let's be honest. Because, see, I'm, I'm, I'm in love with the Word. Y'all think we should maybe do this for eight hours next time for six weeks every Monday? How many would come? I'm glad you're honest. <laughs> Are your thoughts accusing you or condemning you? <laughs> okay, how about we did it for four hours straight next on the Monday mornings? How many would come then? <laughs> I'll think about it. We never got to the point about the harlot's forehead today. You know that? Lady, we did this on a Sunday. This church would look like a mob. <laughs> no one would show up if it mean these four empty walls okay I'm all set here we go Psalms 1 how blessed is that man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked verse 2 his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he's doing what meditating day and night and he will be see here how the thoughts change the heart circumcise the heart he will be like, there's a process, what he will become. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. Is that the fullness of God? Yeah. Which yields his fruit in the season. His leaf will not wither. That's his life. And whatever he does, he will prosper, which means he will press through the righteousness. And we almost made it. Father, we thank you for your word. Let's just pray this together. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Cause us to hate our minds. Cause us to hate our minds. Our logic. Our reasonings. reasonings. Give us the mind of Christ only. only. You've done that, Father. Father. We ask you now by your Spirit. spirit. Stir up that mind within us. Cause that mind to possess us. Cause those thoughts to own us. That comes only from God. Seal in us today what we've heard. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We will start there next time, and that's Romans 8, 5 through 7. And I still think there's a few tapes left in the last session on Romans. You might want to start on the tape table and pick them up if you want them. God's grace be with you. We're dismissed. Oh, Lord, my secretary comes late, but you can You are spending a day with me. Don't forget Bible school tonight at 6 o'clock. I think tonight uh, Brother Rick Moore will teach the first session or either Brother Fernando, but I know they're rotating it back and forth. I decided on this one that I'll teach only three weeks at night and let them have a chance to teach also. Amen? We had the women last time, we got the men this time. Hallelujah. Oh, are there any questions? I forgot to ask. Are there any questions? Any questions? Any questions?
No questions. All right. Okay. But God has been perfect today. You wrote, you wrote the Roman because they go back to the Jewish teaching. You want to spend a day with me today, Matthew. You can see Uncle Victor. Let's pray for this child before we leave here. So, everyone, just gather around, lay hands on him. Lord Jesus, we lift him up before you. We come against his sickness, the infirmities in his body, in Jesus' name. You said to lay hands on the sick that shall recover. We lay hands on him. We are in our part. And Father, we put our faith in it. We look to you to do your part. You're so faithful. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. 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 Right.